All right, welcome back everyone. In this video module, we're talking about modes of listening. In the previous module, we were talking about the different forms that sound takes. And the complement of that is that not only does sound take multiple forms, but as we'll see, we listen to it in quite a number of distinct modes and ways. Now this is actually quite an important topic and it's something we'll come back to uh, at multiple times and in multiple ways throughout the course. Uh, and I want to think a little bit first about why this topic is so important. On the slide we have in front of us here, we have a representation of audio production, of work with audio uh, as a feedback cycle. Uh, imagine that we've recorded something and that we're now working in some digital audio workstation software on transforming those recordings uh, into an artistic product of some kind. And so we are here, the listening artist, and we are making movements with our muscles that are touching the mouse or the keyboard. And um, this action on a computer's hardware is being translated into um, events inside the software um, where sound signals are being calculated and the hardware is then producing those sound signals and they're coming back out into the air as pressure waves, maybe in headphones or from some loudspeakers, uh, and they come back to us again, uh, to our ears and to our mind, and the cycle kind of continues. So um, in this cycle of audio production, the, the artist who is listening to what is coming out of the software and the hardware uh, is, a, is a key moment. And so the way in which they're listening um, is going to have an enormous effect on the result. And so for us as students of audio, as people trying to get better working with audio, um, it's not just going to be about these parts, about hardware, software, hardware, about what happens acoustically, but it's also going to be about expanding and perhaps even improving sometimes the way that we listen. So this is why it's useful to think about the many uh, modes with which we listen. And another comment that I want to make before we talk about some of the common modes of listening is that, that this list of modes we're going to look at is not exhaustive. Um, if you read more about this, you'll realize that there is even some controversy uh, at times about the different ways in, in which we listen. And there are lots of people that have put forward at different times uh, and in different places different concepts of how people listen or of how people should listen. Uh, and it's not my intention here to really take a stand in any of those debates, but rather just to call our attention to the diversity of ways in which we do listen. So here's some of the ways of listening that are, I think we're going to talk about a lot and we're going to experience a lot in this course. Referential listening uh, is a type of listening where primarily what we're doing is identifying the source of the sound. For example, if I hear something and I say, it's a dog, I'm not really saying anything about what the sound sounds like, but I'm definitely saying something about where the sound came from about where it originated. Um, so each of the above statements, a dog, Dr. Zero, a piano, an annoying person, the sounds of the city, they're all statements about where the sound is coming from. And probably if someone asks you, what are you hearing, what are you listening, um, you've answered in this way in many situations. And as we've already noted, this isn't a statement about what any of those things sound like. Uh, in fact, if we look at these words, a dog, Dr. Zero, piano, an annoying person, etc. Um, these are not in and of themselves inherently statements about sound at all. A dog can also make no sound. So can I. A piano cannot be played. An annoying person can not particularly make sound. Uh, and so on and so forth. So when we engage in referential listening, we make a reference back to what made the sound but there's no information about sound as such in that reference. Another type of listening that we um, employ a lot in everyday life is symbolic listening. 
Um, and symbolic listening is listening that treats sound as codes that can be translated into some other meaning. And the um, most salient example of this would be spoken language. We listen to the stream of sounds that come from someone's voice, and in that stream of sounds we identify some of those as phonemes, and then phonemes go together to make words, and words go together to make sentences, um, and sentences um, you know, may go, go to make paragraphs, and those sentences and paragraphs themselves might be understood on multiple levels and in multiple ways. So in this process of taking the sound and um, decoding it to get some meaning out of it, some symbolic meaning out of it, we're often moving away uh, from the sound uh, as we do that. Um, we, the sound is necessary for the meaning to be communicated to us, but once we've um, turned it into words and turned it into sentences and paragraphs and propositions, the sound doesn't play a key role anymore. It is to some extent discarded. So another type of listening, um, and it's one that we're going to explore, uh, I think, in some interesting ways in this course, uh, is called reduced listening. And in reduced listening, um, what we do is we identify sonic phenomena using vocabulary that is sound-specific. In other words, using vocabulary that is inherently tied to sound and sounds and ideas about sound. Um, for example, when we say that something is quiet, that, that is a statement that cannot really or fundamentally be about anything other than a sound. Okay, it's true that we also use the word quiet metaphorically. We might say a quiet person to maybe talk about their personality. Um, but that metaphorical use is referring to a more fundamental, um, basic uh, use of the word that has to do with, with sound. Are the, is the sound quiet or is it conversely loud? Another common example of reduced vocabulary would be to talk about higher pitch and lower pitch. Like we might say that this sound is higher than this one, which is lower. There are also sounds um, that, um, very, very specific sounds, uh, very specific words for things that can only be sounds. And that's also vocabulary that we can use in reduced listening. When we say that something is a hiss or a pop or a boom, these are not things that make sounds. These are themselves sounds. So this type of listening uh, is important for a number of reasons, and we will come back to this in a later video module, but I just want to briefly say now that reduced listening um, is something that we have to do when we don't know or when we can't really say what it is that we're hearing. In other words, when the source of a sound is ambiguous in some sense, we are put in the situation of um, being compelled to do reduced listening. Uh, and as we're going to see, that makes it quite important for people who are working with audio creatively. So a type of listening um, that is increasingly common uh, in a world in which audio products, uh, in which sound, art, and music are being made with lots of technology is technological listening. And in some ways, this is a variation of referential listening. Uh, so we'll talk in a second about how they're different. Um, but basically, the idea is that when we do technological listening, we, um, we identify not only where the sound originally comes from, but we identify the chain of technologies that brings the sound to us and to our perception. And on this slide, I've got a picture of a, a guitar amplifier because guitarists, electric guitarists, are, are aficionados of technological listening, and they're doing it all the time. Um, we might hear them on stage, and if we are just going to um, listen to them referentially, we would say, well, I hear a guitarist playing. But if we're listening to that um, guitarist technologically, and guitarists themselves do this all the time, we might say, we might hear that they're playing the guitar that it's a particular type of guitar, that it's going through a particular amplifier that's giving another um, character or signature to the sound. And when we hear the sound, 
we hear all of those parts of that chain. Um, so it's, it's hearing those, those chains of sounds as they get transformed, as they arrive to, uh, to us, that is characteristic of technological listening. Closely related, um, but uh, not the same, would be calibrated listening. And we're going to be doing a lot of that in this course. Um, what we have here on the slide is uh, actually a screenshot from the Reaper digital audio workstation from a filter um, from an equalizer in the Reaper digital audio workstation. And we see a large number of controls um, here. We're going to talk about these in a later module in the course, what these controls mean and how they affect the sound. Um, but the important point now for understanding what we mean by calibrated listening is to realize that each of these controls, and they're, they're reflected down here as well, um, they have a large number of possibilities, uh, a large number of settings. Um, often those settings take the form of numbers that can be uh, increased or decreased. And when we do calibrated listening, um, what that really means is that we're listening to sound in a way um, that we can relate very directly to settings in hardware or software. Or if I would say the same thing in a slightly different way, we're listening in a way that measures the sound using the types of um, units of measurement that we find in audio hardware and software. Um, some of those units of measurement are visible over here on the left. There's a frequency control, in hertz, a gain, in decibels, uh, and a, a bandwidth control in octaves. Now, we don't need to worry now um, much about what those means, uh, what any of those mean, but we can um, just note that there are these units of measurement and that they can be increased or decreased over some range. When we're doing calibrated listening, we're listening to things and we're, um, we're guessing or predicting, or maybe if we're really confident, we're knowing what the corresponding measurements would be. And this is obviously a really useful kind of listening if we're going to be working with um, particular audio hardware and software in what we're doing. Because if we have cultivated the skill of calibrated listening to some or other extent, um, then maybe we'll be able to dial in the settings that we want or the settings that a project need somewhat quicker um, than if we had to um, sort of wander around um, to find the right setting. That said, I think that wandering around to find the right setting is a large part of the way that we learn this skill, uh, and it's also quite fun. Um, we can also uh, learn this skill. We can also improve our ability to do calibrated listening um, with exercises, um, such as the exercises in the inner ear platform um, that we often do in the tutorials in this course. So uh, f another type of listening, uh, I think the final type for our list today, would be background ubiquitous listening. And I've got here a book cover from Anahid Kasabian's book, Ubiquitous Listening, which introduced the term ubiquitous listening. Uh, and, and that book uh, is, re is really um, pointing to and, and attempting to analyze types of listening that are inattentive and that are in the background of everyday life, that are not... Uh, consciously attended to, are not um, directly parsed um, for meaning or for some kind of content or for some other kind of thing that we're getting out of it uh, consciously. Um, we're probably not going to pay a lot of attention to this mode of listening uh, in the course, um, but I, I do want to, uh, to note that it's there and that there is scholarship about it. So some key points uh, from this video module. We saw that people can listen in different ways or modes. Um, we emphasize that because listening is such an important part of the audio production cycle, um, cultivating an awareness of it and perhaps expanding our abilities is important. And at a few points, we um, hinted that you can learn to listen differently, um, perhaps expanding your ability to switch between these modes and perhaps expanding what you can do within a given mode, for example, within calibrated listening. <laughs>